Thanks a lot to the organizers. Is the speaker okay? The, the, okay. Okay, so the, the, Maybe you should say your own name just for the benefit of. Oh, Monsieur? I, anything with an L and I'm, I'm happy. So La Place Lagrange is also over. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let me start off by telling you what this dynamical mordell lang conjecture is. It's kind of a conjecture out of arithmetic dynamics, and my goal today is to explain to you how you can use it to solve some more geometric problems. So here's the conjecture we're talking about. So suppose I have an endomorphism of a variety over C. I have a point in X, a closed point, and then I have a subvariety of X. as well. And now the question is this, if you start with this point P and you keep applying this endomorphism uh, phi to P and you just see what happens to P, the question is for what values of n is phi n of P going to be an out to land in this subvariety V? So here's what the conjecture says. It says that the set of n such that phi n of P is in V is a union of a finite set and finitely many arithmetic progressions. Right, and this is a bit of a mouthful, so for the rest of the talk I'm going to call such a set semi-linear. A semi-linear set is the union of a finite set and finitely many arithmetic progressions. So it's just telling you the set of n such that phi n of p is in v is not just some random set. It can't happen. It's impossible that phi n of p is in v exactly when n is a prime or something like that. There's some predictability to this. Okay, it's a conjecture, but there's one important case that's known. It's a, th a theorem in the Etal case, proved by Bell, Gioca, and Tucker. And I'll say a little bit about this later. So it's only when you have ramification on this fee that you start to get into trouble. Okay, so you're probably wondering, how did it get this name? What does this have to do with the uh, Mordell-Lang conjecture? So let me, let me just briefly say what the deal is. So this conjecture is interesting even in a lot of very simple cases, even for things like linear maps on PN or translations on abelian varieties. And the name comes from what this conjecture is saying in the case of abelian varieties. So if X is abelian, and your automorphism is just translation by some element gamma on your abelian variety. What's the conjecture saying? It's saying that this set of n such that n times gamma lands in some particular subvariety v is a semilinear set again. So this is uh, closely related to the Mordell-Lang conjecture, which was proved by faultings. And what this conjecture says is, say you have an abelian variety again and a subvariety V. If you pick any finitely generated subgroup of the abelian variety, then the set of G in your group that happened to land in the subvariety V is a union of of cosets of subgroups of G. So this is supposed to be for any finitely generated group, but in the case when your group has just one generator, when you're just doing translation by one element, that's what the dynamical mordell lang conjecture is. So the, the case of rank one where your group is just Z is, is quite a bit easier and predates faultings, but at least morally, this is where it's coming from. I mean, what, the situation you should imagine here is that x is an abelian, well, let's say v, is a, v in x is a curve sitting inside its Jacobian, and g is the group of rational points on the Jacobian. And so you're saying that the set of rational points that are actually on the curve inside the Jacobian, we understand. So that's, that's where the name comes from. 
Okay, so what's my goal today? I have kind of three main themes I want to touch on. So the first is just to tell you an extension of this conjecture, and it's still a theorem in the tall case. And all I'm going to do is instead of requiring P to be a closed point and B, V to be a subvariety, I'm going to allow both of these to be arbitrary closed subschemes of X. Sorry, I should have specified my X is smooth here. So we don't require projective or anything. It should be true for any, any variety. OK, but the, the statement still makes sense in this setting. And again, if the map is a tall, it's true in exactly the same way. But I'm going to give a slight refinement that gives you some control over the length of these arithmetic progressions when we have different closed subschemes with the same support. OK, the, the second thing, so this generalization to schemes is not just generalization for the sake of generalization. It turns out that when you allow non-reduced subschemes, this conjecture actually has some very geometric content. And that's what I want to describe. So we do actually gain something by doing this. And then to maybe just illustrate that it could be a little useful, I'll show you how to extend some known results about automorphisms of blow-ups uh, using this dynamical Morda Lang result. So the main thing we'll generalize is a paper by, by Rakhtar and Kanta. Uh, there's other papers by Trong that we s slightly extend. Uh, and then there, it's, there's actually a paper by Ar Arnold that's a little more dynamical in flavor. And I think our, so we generalize it slightly, but more interesting, we take these results of Arnold and we sort of show that they can really be understood as more or less a case of this non-reduced dynamical more than Lang injection. Okay, so I'll come back to what this conjecture is and what our extension is in a minute. But let me first try to illustrate the kind of geometric setting where this kind of thing is useful. So here's just a, a warm-up question. So let's say I have a surface over C and I have an automorphism of the surface. And let's say I have a fixed point little x. and a curve C through X. All right, so here's my surface X. I have some automorphism with a fixed point. If I have this curve and I just keep applying the automorphism, I'm going to get a lot of other curves passing through the point. Again, because it's a fixed point, they all go through here. And let's actually assume that we have infinitely many curves. So it's an infinite order automorphism, and C is not periodic. OK, this, this is not a question. Here's, here's the question. The question is, can you blow up this point x? You know, maybe do a sequence of blow ups. But can you find a birational map such that two things happen? So first is that your automorphism induces an automorphism of y. And second is that all of these infinitely many curves through the point become disjoint after you do this blow up. And we can only reasonably ask that they be disjoint above the point x that we're blowing up, because they're going to intersect at all kinds of other points as well. OK, so let me just point out what the, the easy version is. So if all the curves go through x and have different tangent directions at x, you blow up once. Because you're blowing up a fixed point, your automorphism lifts, right? It, it acts on the tangent space. Because all these things had different tangent directions, you're immediately done. Because they immediately are separated by this first blow up. So the time you get into trouble is if your curves are tangent to each other at the point c. Because then to make them disjoint, you're going to need to blow up more than once.
Okay, and yeah, again, the issue is, you know, maybe some of these curves are tangent to very, very high order and you're in trouble. Okay, so I think there are basically two, two main issues that you have to deal with here. So if you sat down and tried to prove this, this is what you run up against. So the, the first thing that could go wrong is maybe it happens that phi n of c is tangent to c at x exactly when n is a perfect square or something. Just for, or, you know, a prime or any other weird sequence. Maybe it's unpredictable when these two things are tangent to each other. So what would happen if you tried to do this blow up stuff now? So we have this surface, I have these curves through here. Some of them are tangent to each other and some of them are not. So I blow up the point, I create this exceptional divisor. Now some of these things still go through this fixed point, through the same point on the exceptional fiber. So phi k squared of n will all meet at a single point still, so they're not disjoint. On the other hand, all the ones that weren't tangent at the point are going to go through the exceptional divisor at different places. All right now, and if I want to achieve my first goal, which is to make all the phi n of c disjoint above x, I need to blow up this point to you know, separate them so they don't meet there anymore. On the other hand, this is clearly not a fixed point of my automorphism on the blow up, because otherwise all the curves would go through here. So if I try to blow this up, I'm not going to get an automorphism of the blow up. So th this would be fatal if this could happen. I need to blow this up to make these disjoint. I can't blow it up because it's not fixed. And I, this sort of shows, I think, these two goals are kind of intention. So if you want to make your automorphism lift to the blow up, you can't blow up too much or the automorphism will disappear. Yeah, I mean, it, it's possible these other things could meet it all. Right? I mean, it, it's easy to rule this out, in fact, right? especially in the two-dimensional case. Yeah, you're right. So th this is not a, not a real problem. The, the more severe issue is is this. Actually, maybe I should say in connection with that, though, it could happen that, well, never mind. OK, th this is one issue, but it's easily dealt with, as we, as we heard. The second and more, the bigger problem is maybe the order of tangency is not bounded in n. So maybe it happens that phi 100 of c is tangent to c to order 2, phi 1,000 is tangent to c to order 3, and so on, and there's just no bound. But in any finite set of curves, you could separate by a finite set of blow-ups. So when you have infinitely many curves, you can't always do it. Because if you have a high order of tangency, you're going to need to blow up more times. If the order of tangency is unbounded, you need infinitely many blow-ups. And just to illustrate that this has some content, let me point out that when phi is not at all, this is completely false. You just can't do it. So if your map is just xy goes to xy squared, and you start with the curve c, which is x equals y, what do you get? You get a x equals y, then you get a parabola x equals y to the fourth, x equals y to the eighth, and these curves do get more and more and more tangent. And no matter how many times you blow up this point, you're never going to make them all disjoint. So the, the moral here is if your map is not a tall, this ramification can break it, and this is completely false. You, this sequence of blow-ups is impossible. So what we need to show is that if our map is an automorphism, there is a uniform bound on the order of tangency at the point. Okay, and in the surface case, you can actually do this just by messing around with power series. But in higher dimensions, it's a little trickier. And I want to tell you the theorem that sort of solves it all at once. OK, so here's the, here's the solution. So let's say we're in the setting of the mordell lang conjecture. I have an atoll endomorphism. a smooth variety over C. I have Y and Z, two closed subschemes of X. All right, the theorem is, part one is that 
the set of n such that phi n of y is contained in z is semilinear. Okay, th this is exactly the dynamical Morda Lang statement, but for these non reduced schemes. The part that's harder, let me state this. So I'm going to give you the statement and then tell you how it solves this issue too here. But here's the statement. So say I have some finite set of, of subschemes of x. I'm going to call them y01 up to y0r. Uh, this is a bad choice of board here. So I have a finite set of subschemes. I then form an infinite set of subschemes as follows. So I take my finite set of subschemes. They're defined by ideal sheaves i, y, i, 0. I take my yj to be various schemes that are of the form yi0. Sorry. I take the ideal of yi0 I raised to the ni. Right, this, this defines some new subscheme, and my yj are all going to be subschemes of this particular form. So it's some kind of thickening of the, of the y's. So for example, if I only have one y in my collection here, maybe it's just a closed point, then these yj's are just thickenings defined by powers of the maximal ideal. Okay, so let me get to this statement here. Uh, sorry, I messed up my sliding boards. But, but here's what we're going to say. So I have all these infinitely many subschemes. I know that for each one, the set of n such that this holds is semilinear. The statement is if your schemes are these particular schemes, then the periods of these arithmetic progressions are actually independent of j. So all the yj's have the same length of the arithmetic progression. So I, I need a technical condition here, with, which I'll come back to in a second. OK, so the theorem is continuing over here. So the statement is that the set of n such that phi n of yj contained in Z is semilinear for all J. So it's a union of arithmetic progressions, but these progressions don't get longer as you take thicker and thicker subschemes. Is this statement makes sense. So I, I start with a finite set of schemes. I form an infinite set of schemes just by taking sums of the defining ideals, just by intersecting certain thickenings of my finite set of schemes. The claim is that the semilinear sets I get, the length of the arithmetic progression there, the step size is bounded in J. So the step size. Yeah, the step size. But maybe I shouldn't call it length. OK, let me, let me unravel what this is saying and why it solves our surface question. So back to the question. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our scheme y1 to just be the original curve c we start with. So y10 is c, and y20 is just the point x as a reduced scheme. And now we're going to consider the following schemes which are of this form. So yj is going to be this scheme. Uh, well, we have to define it by ideal sheaves. So iyj is going to be defined by taking iy1 plus iy2 to the j plus 1. So what, ha what happens when I plug in j equals 2 here, for example? So I get the ideal of the curve plus the square of the ideal for the point. So I get a tangent vector to the curve at the point.
what happens when I take j to be bigger? I get the ideal of the curve plus some higher thickening of the point, but I get some kind of kth order germ of the curve at the point x. Okay, so again, let, let me plug in this specific y1 and see what it says. So it tells us that the set of n, such that phi n of c1, what did I call it, uh, y1, is contained in c is semilinear. But when is phi n of y1 contained in c? Well, what is phi n of y1? y1 is a tangent vector to c. Phi n of y1 is what we get when we apply the automorphism to the tangent vector. And so when is phi n of y1 uh, contained in C, it's whenever phi n of C is tangent to C at x. And so one output of the theorem is that the set of n such that phi n of C is tangent to C at our point in this setting is a semilinear set. Which again in the surface case is just easy linear algebra. Okay, but this solves our issue one, more or less. It tells us that you're, you're not going to end up with unpredictable numbers of times when the curves are tangent here. It's essentially just an arithmetic progression. But what does it say, this is the more interesting case, when I plug in the yj with higher j? So it says that the set of n such that phi n of yj is contained in C is semilinear. What is that? Well, that's the set of n such that c is tangent to phi n of c to order at least j at the point x. But not only that, the, the length of the steps in the arithmetic progressions we get here is independent of j. Okay, so here, here's, I mean, this is the important part, that the step size is independent of j. Because this implies that there's a uniform bound on the order of tangency, which is essentially what issue two is about. Can I safely, well, let me erase over here again. So here's why. So suppose that it were ever going to happen that c is tangent to phi n of c to order a million. You know, maybe there's some really big n uh, for which they're tangent to order a million. But, but what do we know? We know this set of things such that it's tangent to a given order is there's some uniform bound n on how frequently that happens. So if it's ever tangent to order a million, it has to be tangent to order a million for some n within the first capital N iteration. See what I'm saying? So there's, there's some, let me call it m instead. There's some m such that it's ever tangent to order a million. It's tangent to order a million within the first m steps. And for the same m, if it's ever tangent to order a billion, it's tangent to order a billion within the first m steps. So if you want to know the maximum tangency that can ever occur, you know that the maximum order of tangency is within the first m steps. Right? This m is independent of the order of tangency. You know, together with this finite set. So if you want to know the maximum order of tangency, you need to look through the first m iterates, and then you need to examine this finite set and make sure nothing weird ever happened there. Right? But there's a uniform bound. You can't have this issue, too, that you have these freak tangencies to high order for large n. Okay, and in fact, this statement is the result of our node that I alluded to earlier. But 
once you take this point of view, this result is really just a case of this uh, dynamical Mordell Lang type statement. Oh, sorry, I, I would be in trouble if I didn't. So, so I have two questions. But so, so, can you replace these powers with any sub scheme that has the same support? That the no, it's false if you replace it with the same support. So, the reason we need these to be, for, I'll, I'll say a little in a second, but the reason we need these things to be of this particular type is that the strategy is you find a p-adic model over which all these sub schemes are defined. So you need all of the yj's that you're considering, this infinite set, to be defined over the same finitely generated extension of z. So if they're all of this form, then the defining equations are all defined over the same ring and you have no trouble. But if you have infinitely many and they're not all defined over the same thing, it, it's trouble. Actually, to that statement, we don't know a counter example. But, oh sorry, same support is definitely not, not enough. We, we have a counter example for that. In, in fact, in that case, they, in our counterexample, they all have the same support, but, and they're all defined over the same ring, but this technical condition fails. So let me tell you the technical condition, just okay, so I... And that other question. Oh, yeah, thanks. So when you say that something is an arithmetic progression, you actually mean that it starts as soon as possible? Yeah, that's right. In fact, it's a... So I'm talking about automorphisms here, and it's a two-sided arithmetic progression, okay. so it goes in both directions. For the conjecture in general, it doesn't have to start as soon as possible. Yeah, I mean, here it's a diandomorphism, so I think you are... Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. So it doesn't start as soon as possible. Yeah, I should clarify. In the case that's an automorphism, in fact, these are two-sided arithmetic progressions. Yeah, but then your argument that it starts at the first M step, you don't... Oh yeah, but I mean, th this is false in the endomorphism case. I, I sh th this uniform bound is only in the automorphism case. Just the example of xy goes to xy squared because it's false in the ramified case. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, you're right. So in the etal case, it's okay. They will be arithmetic, but you don't know when they start, I guess. Yeah, so then the proof you said is not... Correct. That's right. That proof was just for the automorphism case. Yeah, I'm sorry. That proof was just for the surface thing. Okay, so let me tell you the technical condition just in the interest of full dis disclosure. So I'm mostly going to ignore this for the rest of the talk because it doesn't really create any difficulties for the proof, but I should tell you the truth. So you, need, you have these infinitely many s closed subschemes. You need to know that the set of all associated points of the yj's that you care about is finite. And without this, we actually do have a counterexample. But in, in geometric applications, you don't really have to. It takes care of itself. Yes. Can you use symbolic powers? Uh, it should still be true, I think. Yeah, that's a good point. We should try to work this out, I think. It, though it turns out this is exactly what you want when you sit down and try to write out the proof. OK, and, and this is actually not automatic, which I thought was surprising, but I'm not much good at commutative algebra. In fact, you can write down a finite set of closed subschemes and an infinite set of subschemes of this form, and the set of associated points of these is infinite, even though you only started with two things. Okay, so I won't, I won't mention this again, I think. Okay, so is the, is the setup here clear? Any questions so far? I mean, the important thing is this output that this Uniform uh, dynamical Mordell Lang statement gives you bounds on order of tangency in the case of an automorphism. Okay, so let me record kind of the geometric conclusion you get out of this argument. So, uh, I mean, the, it turns out the answer to the question I started with is yes, let me tell you the theorem now. So we have a smooth projective variety over C. And then automorphism phi from X to X. I have V inside X that's co-dimension 2. And it's fixed by phi. 
and then I have a divisor, an irreducible, well, B should be irreducible too. It doesn't actually matter. But I have an irreducible divisor inside X that contains V. So this is exactly the setting I had in the surface case. In the surface case, I had an automorphism of a surface. My invariant co-dimension 2 thing was the fixed point. My irreducible divisor containing V was this curve through the point. So it's exactly the same situation, but in higher dimensions. And here's the, here's the conclusion. So there's a birational map from y to x. We can assume y is smooth, such that the following things hold. So first is that our automorphism lifts to y. And second is that we separated the divisors d above v as much as possible, just like in the two-dimensional case. So there's a little issue here, which is that if I have, you know, even in a threefold, say I have two surfaces intersecting along a curve in a threefold, if I blow up the curve, I'm not going to make them disjoint above the entire curve. You know, maybe they still intersect along some other curve transverse to the curve. But I can at least blow up above the curve and make it so they're disjoint above, you know, a sufficiently general point of the curve. And so that's, that's all you can hope for, and that's what's true. So if I take phi m of d, and I take the strict transform on y, and I intersect it with phi n of d, the strict transform on y. And then I look at the image of that on x, it doesn't contain v. So, you know, maybe it still meets a point of d, they're not disjoint above every point of v, but they're as disjoint as they can be. And let me just remark on why this is a little trickier than the two-dimensional version. So in dimension two, you can just sit down and bash out the defining equation of the curves and play with some power series, and it's true. Uh, the problem in higher dimensions is you, because there might not be any fixed points at all of phi on v. So it's hard to pick local coordinates at a point and just work with power series and local coordinates. And you can try to work in the completion of the local ring at v, but the map you get there is it's a bit of a, a mess to do this. So the, the higher dimensional version is a little more subtle because of the absence of fixed points here. Okay, but, but this theorem essentially answers the question we started with. Everything we were hoping to be true is true. Okay. Of planes. Yeah, so that the, that the line you get infinitely many lines. Yeah, that's right. And so then there will be so infinite. Yeah, but your v is co-dimension three in this case. I mean, you're starting with planes intersecting at a point. Oh, sorry, so it's a, oh, sorry v is co-dimension yeah, two in co x. Two, I see. I see. Yeah, it has to be co-dimension two, or like you say, it's I not see, true. It's okay. okay so. <laughs> you scared me there. Yeah, with, without co-dimension 2, I think you can still make some statements, but that it's not going to work as well as you hope. Okay, so I'm not going to really prove it or even pretend to prove it, but let me instead discuss another special case that maybe you've seen before. Uh, just to suggest what the general strategy of the proof is going to be. So let's say I just have a linear automorphism of P2. And I'm just going to write down what it is. It's given by a matrix of, looks like this. OK, and then let's say P is a point. I'll call it x2, x1, x0. 
And V is just the set of things where my first coordinate is equal to zero. It's a coordinate hyperplane. Uh, the first one. I any of them, but let let's say the first one. Okay, so what, what happens when I start applying this matrix to a vector x2, x1, x0? Well, what's, what's phi of p? What I do is I take some linear combination of these things, and then I uh, remember x2 and x1 and forget x0. My indices are off here, right? But if I keep iterating this, what am I going to do? It's sort of a Fibonacci type sequence, right? It's a linear recurrence sequence. So phi n of p is going to be the nth, n minus first, and n minus second term of some linear recurrence sequence. If you've taught linear algebra recently, you probably did this with Fibonacci numbers, I think. So what is the set of n such that phi n of p lands in the coordinate hyperplane? It's the set of n such that the nth term of a linear recurrence sequence is zero. Oh, I picked the wrong hyperplane here. Well, okay, I'm off by two. It's the set of n such that xn plus two is zero. All right, so for the Fibonacci sequence, it's obviously you're never going to have the nth term equal to zero, right? But if you had a linear recurrence sequence where some of the c's are positive and some are negative, that's not clear at all. You know, sometimes it could be zero. And so what the dynamical immortal Lang theorem says in this case is that the set of n such that the nth term of a linear recurrence sequence is zero is a semilinear set. This is actually a sort of classical theorem from the 30s. It's called the skolem muller lech theorem. And this is, this is actually not easy either. So if, again, you might think, well, that should be easy, because I taught linear algebra. I know the nth term of the sequence is just some linear combination of powers of the eigenvalues. The problem is if you have two eigenvalues with the same absolute value, it's unpredictable the set of n for which this thing actually is going to cancel out and give you zero. Okay, but the skolem muller lech theorem says, in fact, the set of n such that the nth term of a Fibonacci type sequence is zero is semilinear. <laughs> semilinear means it's a union of finitely many arithmetic progressions and a <coughs> finite set. Okay, so uh, I don't know if you've, if you've seen the proof of this, but the only way to prove this is to use p-adic analysis. In fact, the way you prove our dynamical Morda Lang is also using sort of p-adic dynamical strategies. So let me tell you just the idea of the proof of, of Skolem Mahler Lech. And the proof of our theorem is just sort of a souped up version of this. I mean, I should stress, we really just follow the strategy of Belgioka and Tucker for these things. So here's the idea. I have this map that I give it an integer n, and it gives me an integer, which is the nth term of the arithmetic progression. Sorry, the arithmetic recurrence sequence. But it turns out that what you can do is that actually the map that sends n to xn can be extended to a map from zp to zp for a, a suitable choice of p, a map on the p-adics, at least modulo k. For some k.
But the interesting thing is, so you have this arithmetic recurrence. It inputs an integer, outputs an integer. You extend this to input a p-adic, output a p-adic. But you can actually extend it as a p-adic analytic function. So you sort of, you have this map defined on z, you interpolate it to a map defined on zp, a p-adic analytic map. And a p-adic analytic map is either always zero or it has only finitely many zeros. And the, the reason you end up with a finite union of recurrence sequences is you, you, end up, you have to split z into a finite number of, I mean you split it up mod k for some k. And then for each residue class mod k, either this map is identically zero or it has only finitely many zeros. And then this is where the skull of Mahler Lange comes from. And so the, the Belgioka Tucker strategy for dynamical Mordell Lang is you do the same idea. We have this map from a variety to itself. You know, phi n of x is defined for n and z, but you can extend it to get a map defined for n and z p, and then that, again, is p-adic analytic, and you know it's either identically zero or zero only finitely many times. I mean, this statement that it's either identically zero or zero only finitely many times is exactly an analog of the fact that if you have a power series over C uh, and you have a compact set, the set of zeros in the compact set is either, it's either identically zero in the compact set or it has finitely many zeros. ZP is a compact set. Okay, and again, the, the basic gist of our proof is the same thing, to do some kind of p-adic interpolation, following these other guys. I think that's all I'll say about the proof. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so let me tell you how you can actually use this geometrically. I mean, this statement about blowing up and making things disjoint, it's not obvious that this has any purpose whatsoever. So here's an application. So say I have an automorphism of x. In fact, now I need a projective hypothesis. But I have an automorphism of objective variety. Now let's suppose I have a divisor d inside x, irreducible. Uh, such that when I look at its intersections with itself under this map, it doesn't intersect itself very much. So the set of the union over all n that's not zero of d intersect phi n of d. It's not uh, Zariski dense. I'll tell you, I mean, there are examples of such maps, but as I'm about to tell you, there are not interesting examples of such maps. So here's what the theorem says. So then there exists a map, uh, I'll call it F, from X down to C, a smooth curve. Sorry, only a rational map. And an automorphism of the curve. Uh, that commutes. So I have this automorphism of X, but my automorphism has a rational vibration over a curve. Okay, let, let me illustrate this with an example. So take a map from P2 to P2 that's just a linear map. Probably has three fixed points, so take a line that goes through a fixed point. So what happens when I keep applying this map repeatedly to the line? I get a bunch of other lines through the fixed point. 
So in this case, what's the set of d intersect phi n of d? Well, it's just a single point. The phi n of d never intersect d anywhere except this point. And so the, th the theorem tells us that actually this, this map has to admit an equivariant vibration down to a curve. And in this example, there obviously is one, right? I just project from the point, get a map down to P1, and there's an induced map on P1 that, that commutes with this one like we want. And again, only a rational map in general. Okay, but, but what this theorem is saying is that this is the only way this can happen, is if, if you have a divisor whose orbit under an automorphism doesn't intersect itself very much, it must just be that the divisor is the fiber of a map to a curve and the automorphism is just translating D between the fibers. But unless this happens, a divisor must intersect itself a lot under an automorphism. All right, and here's the, the idea of how to prove this. So here's, here's my x. Let, let me just draw a simple example and tell you what the thing does here. So here's my divisor. Let's just say I have a surface and d intersect phi n of d is always just these two points. The, the orbits of d under this map never intersect d anywhere except the two points. Well, according to our theorem, I can blow up these points and I can make it so that the curves don't intersect above, the point, above these points. So let me even use colored chalk here. So I have these, these infinitely many phi n of d and they intersect not very much. According to the theorem, I do a blow up and now all of these curves, because they intersected d only at these finitely many points, after I blow up d, they don't intersect each other anywhere whatsoever. Right? If they had no intersection and I blew up and got rid of the intersection, I now have infinitely many disjoint curves inside my surface. And this is a very suspicious situation, right? How can you have a variety x and infinitely many divisors on x that are pairwise disjoint, that don't meet x anywhere at all? There's one obvious way this could happen, which is if your variety fibers over a curve and your divisors are the fibers of the map. But that's sort of the, the only thing you can really think of where this could happen. It, this is a really weird situation. And in fact, it's a theorem that they just put out last year, lucky for us. But if you have a divisor, if you have a variety and you have infinitely many disjoint divisors on it, there must exist a morphism to a curve with the divisors contained in the fibers. So this is proved by Bogomolov, Perutka, Silberstein. And so that, that's where we get our vibration to a curve. We have these things, they don't intersect much. We use our theorem, we make it so they don't intersect at all. Then this other theorem says if you have infinitely many divisors on a variety, they're completely disjoint. In fact, they fiber, the variety fibers over a curve and the divisors are contained in fibers. And so the, the map that our theorem is claiming is just the rational map you get by going to the blow up and then down by the projection. So I, this is not much of a proof and there's other things you need to worry about. You know, for example, how do you know that phi of d and phi 10 of z don't intersect at some other point than these two? I mean, you need to use dynamical mortal lang again to control that. But that's the gist. Okay, let me tell you one more application of these things. Here's our last result. So let's say you start with a s smooth projective variety over C. And now you do a sequence of blow ups at centers of dimension R. Well, when I mean you start with the variety and you start blowing it up. And now the question is, can the blow up have more automorphisms than the original variety?
So this statement's going to be something like you start with a, three, a fourfold, and you blow up points, and you blow up curves. But we're going to place some kind of limit on the dimension of the things you blow up. And there are going to be two kinds of blow-ups that we allow. So either 2r plus 3 is less than or equal to n, meaning you blow up things of less than about half the dimension. So if you're on a five-fold, you're allowed to blow up points, and you can blow up curves, but you're not allowed to blow up surfaces. So if your blow-up satisfies either this extremely high co-dimension condition, or a more moderate co-dimension condition, which is that you blow up things in co-dimension 3 or less, but you're only allowed to blow up very simple things. So either you blow up things of less than half the dimension, or you blow up things of co-dimension at least 3 and of Picard rank 1. The statement is if you have any automorphism of the total space of the blow up, some iterate descends to the original variety. So blowing up can't increase the automorphism group very much. Yeah, exactly. So there are these. Well, just the quadratic transformation, the second iterate descends since it's the identity. But, right. but there are examples where you take P2 and you blow up 10 points or 9 points, and you get infinite order automorphisms of the blow up that don't descend to P2. So if you tried to extend this to the case of codimension 2, it's false. But in codimension 3, it's OK, as long as you only blow up things of Picard rank 1. But yeah, without some hypothesis on what you're blowing up, this is false. But as long as you control what you blow up, some iterate descends to x. OK, so th this first case is actually already known. This was proved by Bayraktar and Kantar. Uh, under the additional hypothesis that rho of x is 1. So we get rid of that hypothesis, but we also allow these you know, blow-ups of much larger dimensional things. OK, now let me also point out, maybe you don't like this hypothesis that the things you blow up are very simple. But the, the good news is we do get at least one new case. Namely, if n is 4 and r is 1, this is automatically satisfied. But it's not covered by this. So if you take a fourfold, you blow up points and curves, you can never get new automorphisms on the total space. Yeah, and it, again, it's sharp in the sense that you can't put a 2 here. But it may or may not be sharp in the sense that it could still be true if you erase this uh, Picard rank 1 hypothesis. We don't know. I mean, there are, there are a few open questions in this direction by Bedford and some other people. So the Venture has been trying to be, of course, that the finite index subgroup descends to it. Yes, and in fact, that's true. So let me tell you the, the next statement. Yeah, so to get that, here's, well, I'm not going to have time to tell you the proof. But in fact, it's true that for any automorphism, not just that some iterate descends on x, but that we know exactly which iterate descends on x. If you're careful with your bookkeeping through the whole proof, you know there's a uniform n for the iterate you need to use. And if you do that, the conclusion you get is uh, so. If if ot x has finite component group, so does ot y. And the proof is more or less what you're suggesting. I think you get a subgroup of GLN with bounded exponent or something like this using this uniformity here. But yeah, sorry, it looks like I won't have any time to tell you how to prove these things. But the idea of the proof is that 
you think about the exceptional divisors of the blow-up. Because of these hypotheses we're putting on the dimension, the exceptional divisors have very simple geometry. You then use the geometry of those exceptional divisors to argue that their intersections with their own iterates under the automorphism have to be very simple. And then you hit it with our theorem and you blow up and get a contradiction. Okay, yeah, let me just say one more word in connection with this corollary. So it seems that in general nobody knows whether or not if you, I have a variety over C, the group of components of the automorphism group is finitely generated. Even for rational surfaces, we don't know, is it true that ought x is a finitely generated group, a component group? But the th theorem is saying if you want to find a counterexample, this is not the way to do it. So if, it's, if you have a variety where it's true, if you blow up high co-dimension things, you're not going to increase the automorphism very much. But, but that's sort of what we'd really like to understand, is how does the automorphism group change under various birational models? And we don't really know. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thanks a lot. That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, in the, in the non atal case, we, I'm sure we can't. In the atal case, maybe the. I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, actually, let me make one more caveat here about this theorem. I got in trouble for this. So, dense has to be the risky dense here. It's actually generally false that it's analytically dense. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's kind of been, like, simpler somehow when it's well, here's, here's the problem. Say you're on a threefold and you blew up some curves. Yeah. So I, I now have two exceptional divisors that are ruled surfaces on the threefold. Okay. And you know, may, maybe they intersect. The thing is, I could contract one of them, and it doesn't contract anything on the other one. Oh. Perhaps. You know, there's no reason that wouldn't happen. Just because the dimensions of the fibers are pretty small. Nice. You know, take P2 blown up at nine points times P1. Now it has zillions of exceptional divisors, but when I blow one down, nothing happens on the other one. Oh, uh, somehow you want more intersections. Yeah, exactly. So when you insist that you blow up things of very high co-dimension, now the fibers are very big. They're very big PNs. And now when I, you contract something on one, that means you actually have to, if you have two that intersect and you contract one of them, if you have this dimensional hypothesis, it implies that the map on the other one contracts something and it's not an isomorphism. And so then you think about, well, what, if, say I have an exceptional divisor, just a PN bundle over something, what are the possible contractible loci? I mean, it's sort of like, like when you're effectively, like, you're like, saying the stable base locus has to have, like, dimension bigger than zero or something like this. Something. Well, here, let me, here's how this Picard rank 1 thing comes in. Yeah. So say you have a PN bundle over something of Picard rank 1. How many contractible divisors are there on it? There's at most one, right? The, the negative curve on a Hertzebrook surface. So if, this e, if two of those things intersect and you can contract one of them, it must intersect along the contractible locus on this one. And if the contractible locus is just a divisor, that means they're all going to intersect along that same locus. And that means you can then blow that up and make them disjoint. But that, that's how this dimensional thing comes in.